afternoon to you all. It's good to see you all with us again. This afternoon, we come for another art workshop, the last one of the year, with Philip Snow, drawing uh, birds in landscapes, the first part. I'll hand over to him now. Mute. Unmuted. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Right. Thank you, David, a.k.a. William. Um, welcome all. Yes, there we are. What an appalling vision. I've got the sunlight pouring through the window again, but I need it to illuminate my drawing below. So without more ado, I'll start sharing screen and introduce a little bit about birds and landscapes. Now, uh, slideshow. Now, can you see the full screen? If somebody could just let me know. No, we've got your um, Microsoft PowerPoint screen. Oh, dear. It's happened again. Uh, uh, just be a second. Uh, just and um, then show. Right. Yeah. Sorry. This has happened before. I, I, it's an ongoing problem. I'm going to have to show it in a diminished form, which will start again. I'm afraid you'll have to see the whole PowerPoint thing, unfortunately. Not quite sure why this is happening, but uh, hopefully you will have all got the email with these examples on. And it is. It was in the magazine, uh, Nature Obs Nature Investigations, uh, of a few weeks ago, I do believe. So hopefully, so you remember in the in the articles what I've been talking about mainly is dividing the page up into thirds. So where there's one third of that section, and one third here, where those one thirds cross, is one of the main areas in a composition to put the main subject of the painting or the composition. So you see here this heron and here where the estuary meets the sea and here where we've got Clandwin, this is Clandwin Island Lighthouse here on Anglesey. That's where one third crosses the top thirds and here with this turn over the sea. So that's one of the basic rules, of course rules are made in, in secular work to be broken, but they, they basically, it's just don't put your main subject in the middle of the painting or, the, or whatever. So um, here's two more very, very different compositions. On the left hand side here, this page of herons and egrets and bitten was for the Collins Field Notebook of British Birds. So if you look carefully, you'll note that they're stuck on with bits of trace paper because one of the ways to use composition is perhaps to do a full landscape first and then draw your bird or animal on tracing paper and move it around the paper over the painting over the sketch to get it into the best position so with these these needed to be moved around uh, for the composition obviously is the whole page and also to allow for the fact there had to be blocks of text put in here, 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 here and here to describe the birds because this is a field guide. On the right hand side there's complete opposite this is a painting which was actually in the Tryon Gallery in, in, in London and sold from there and this is a, a sort of classical composition again the main subject is more or less where the thirds divide the page up this is the main subject but you want to look beyond the bird into the sunset there into the distance so these wings these point up out of the painting and you remember from the my little article in the magazine 
This is one of the ways of using composition. This is roughly using a Y shape to, to bring you into the composition here. It's grounded in the water and it's coming out of the water and it's leading in all these directions into the distance. So it's, it's leading you into the painting. And that's one of the aims of these different types of composition. Here's another two very, very different compositions. This one here is, is actually part of a painting, but you can see that the Kingfisher is part of the, is and roughly again, where the thirds cross in the painting. That's the main subject. Of course, Kingfishers are quite small, they're quite tiny. We're only talking about something about five inches long, maybe six inches with the beak. So you need to get the reeds in proportion. In fact, I later, I put this twig, I painted this twig over the reeds to bring the kingfisher forward because the, well, we won't go into technicalities, but reeds, of course, can be small or large, but you really need to show that this is a small bird in a large landscape. And now this is a really amusing one. This is that beautiful Clandwin Island here on Anglesey. This was a big painting. And I'll just tell you a very amusing little story. The uh, Lady Anglesey, who supposedly owns Clandwin Island, came especially to the exhibition to see this painting of Clandwin Island. And she came in and she marched up to the painting very imperiously and saw this tiny stone chat here at the bottom. And she looked at me and told the whole gallery, the bird's too big, and turned around and walked out and didn't buy the painting. <laughs> which is quite amusing. But it shows you that really, if you're going to put a bird in a landscape, it's got to fit into that landscape. To her, for some reason, this tiny stone chat was too strong. It was taking the eye away from the lighthouse. And so that's one of the problems you're facing when you, you're putting birds and animals or people into landscape. You've got to get the scale right. <laughs> and it really can be difficult. Now, this is... Uh, quite a different approach. This is an osprey down at the Glasslin Valley that's Snowden in the background. And this is a long, narrow painting. I like these long, narrow compositions because it's, it's facing the, it's, it's tracing the course of the river along here and then round. And hopefully you're going into the painting like that, past the osprey and up into the wilds of Snowdonia. So you're trying to lead people into the painting like that. But of course, the osprey is the main, the osprey and the sea trout are the main uh, constituents of the painting here. I put a smaller osprey here coming in, but not too strong. I don't want to take it away from the main focus. So once again, the idea is to anchor something strongly in the painting and have everything else moving away from it. This is a very different approach. I don't know if you how much some of you are into using computer software, I'm not very experienced at all. But I took this photograph here. This is a photograph on Anglesey with the moon reflected in the pool. And I cloned one of my snowy owl paintings onto the snowy owl on a stump because it was the right colors to fit in with the composition and made my own uh, Christmas card. But then again, we've got the, the owl and the I can say the pussycat, the owl and the moon are off center here. And again, it's, it's a question of balancing something out. You're always trying to balance something out. Very different compositions here on the left, top left. This was a sheet I put together for a workshop, sketching workshop, where we've got squirrels and foxes and, and ducks and owls and what have you. And that's just very pleasant occupation of cloning all the different sketches into a page to try and make a nice composition. And you see it's balanced by the weight of the duck on the left, and you quite quite see the, uh, well, if we move that, <laughs> the fox down at the right. And this, this finished painting here is uh, obviously a red squirrel in the woodlands at here on Newbron Anglesey, but we've got the mountain in the background, and that mountain, this is vaguely a cross-shaped composition. Obviously the squirrel is the main uh, occupant of that, of that painting. Incidentally, this painting is about A3 size, which is fairly common for me. 
Now, here's two very different compositions. I've shown this before. This is a huge painting of day five of creation done for John Mackay's Creation Museum in Australia. It's actually printed onto metal and it sits outside in the Creation Museum under the sun. It's about eight foot long now <laughs> by four foot. And of course, composition here, when you try to put in all the birds and animals that you try to imagine were created on, on day five, um, you're going to have to make a sort of freeze of them. So you can see this is vaguely oblong shaped. There's a little centerpiece here, the different swans and greaves and feathers. And so really with a composition like this, it's like painting for um, jigsaws, which I have done. It's like just throw everything in and move them around on tracing paper first and just hope you've got some sort of composition. But you see the weight is all around the side of the painting. I just move that out of the way. It's all around the side of the painting. And so we've got air and light as it were in the middle. And these are all holding it down as it were. And I say, this is a very large painting. Now here's some very different design. <laughs> Just a reminder that there is nothing we have made in the human, in human life that's not as good as nature. This is a termite castle. Termites make this castle out of mud and spit. It's got air conditioning, it's got temperature control, it's got fungi gardens growing the food in the basements, it's got queens and workers and the most incredible design, they're, they're designed to be narrow, so the midday sun in the tropics comes down vertically on them. And the, when they need heating in the morning and cooling in the evening, the sun is on the sides. This is an illustration I did for BBC Wildlife magazine. And this is one element of design. I designed the whole painting and put the text on, and then they added the bits and pieces. So that's another aspect of design, as it were. Right, now we shall uh, stop screen sharing. And I'm going to change cameras now and get down to the actual drawing. Right, let's get this straight. Um, now this is the this is the sheet which was sent out to you, which hopefully you will have uh, printed out. I'll just put that one out of the way. And this is the sheet which was in the magazine. There's one of the original sketches done for that Clandermine Island, and this was in the uh, first magazine. My memory serves me well. But also in the first magazine, I put this in. So we're going to start with the very basics. I think that's the, because everything in, in the world, really in nature is in one of these four shapes, one way or the other, if you count ovals as well. So we're going to draw these things to begin with. Right. So, my, so here we've got to try and get the camera straight. I'm going to start off uh, drawing a cube. And, uh, oh, come on, stop going out of focus. Actually, no, got a light on it, right. So I'm going to draw a, a cube. Now you can see the lens, oh, stop doing that. The uh, lens, we're, we're talking about, draw something about, an inch and a half here. Try and draw it as square as possible. And of course, I'm looking over the over the camera. Might help if I put my glasses on. Oh yeah. <laughs> right now, when we're talking about perspective, this is too small. If this was in perspective, it would go off like that and join up down here. But really, we just want to do a line about 45 degrees, like so and another vertical line, and another one. We want a parallel one along here and across. Whoops, didn't really meet up there. But remember, these are, it's all about not bothering with precision at this point. We want to get a solid shape. So to 
demonstrate that this is shallow. We put shading on one side. So as I always point out, it's good to have a constant light source. So the light is coming in from that side. And then because this is a shadow, we've got the shadow coming out like that. And that's, that's one of the things that helps ground this cube, uh, ground it to the ground as it were. So that's our first basic shape. Our second basic shape is the, uh, the Great Pyramid. Did you know the Great Pyramid is still the most accurate building that human beings have ever made? That's astonishing. Goes back about, well, they don't really, we don't really know. It goes back about three and a half thousand years, probably, but I'm not exactly sure about that. But unlike the cube, this is going to have to go down here. We're going to take the same angle for here. Uh, but it's obviously not going to be as long as this one because it's going away. So if you sort of just suggest it to begin with, it's actually, if you just uh, do it like so, and then again, the shading on this side. and then shadow coming out from it, just to once again ground it or sand it as it were. Remember the lights coming down this way. And the, what's the, oh yes, the third shape, <laughs> the tin of beans as it were, the tin of beans. Now this gets a little more complicated, but basically we want to start with two verticals roughly the, and then at the top, we're going to put an oval. And really, uh, as I, I'm just suggesting with the, the movements of my hand here, just sketch it in, roughly sketch it in to begin with before you, you make it solid as it were. So we immediately have to, bring that down there. And now if we come to about here, we don't need to do the full oval. We just want the, the outer. I won't, but I'll just rub that out so it's not, not confusing. Now the thing about the, the shading is that it's going to come like so. but it's not going to stop in a hard line like that because it's going around the corner. <clears throat> so if we sort of fade it out like that, gives a much better idea that Ro was trying to demonstrate that this is a, a round shape coming towards you. And also that any shadow will come out we want to demonstrate with the shadow that it's a round shape, like so. Now the final, now, <laughs> a circle. What I should have done, of course, I've forgotten to do was to bring a, uh, a circular thing to draw around because these circles can be so, um, We'll pass that one by. We've got enough shape here. We've got we've got squares and diagonals and vague circular circular shapes, and so those are always useful for whatever you're going to draw. Now, like the uh, the demonstration ones here, I've just drawn out some. Uh, rectangles to work in. 
And the first one, remember again, we're, we're dividing all of these into thirds. Again, you don't have to be precise uh, because we know that this is going to have the main subject of interest in this first drawing is the, the shorted owl. But if you notice the way the crops, I said with all of these, I, I took a, I took traditional landscape painting books and took some of their compositions and just stuck my bird on top of them. So in this particular one, the, the crops all go along the line like that. The crops are in diagonals, but they are, if you imagine the rays of the sun, if you do that sort of thing to begin with, you can see that they're all coming. If these went back beyond that, they would all meet at the, at the horizon. <laughs> so we've got these three main shapes here with an owl, which is basically a V-shape at that point. I won't add the hills behind actually, because that will only complicate matters. But so these, these lines of crops, now, as with the perspective, these lines of crops, I'm putting in very simply here, get smaller and smaller as they get to the horizon. And uh, again, I'm, I'm so we're starting down here. Just as simply as possible. Remember, as always, if you're doing these drawings now, you can always don't hurry them now. If you if you want to finish them off later, just put the basics down for now. Obviously, you couldn't do the whole thing in the time that we have. Uh, and these, I'm going to put these in in a little more detail as you're looking down on these crops. Notice the again, they're getting smaller as they go away from you. Of course, these, this sort of thing is more akin to an orchard where you've got room for the tractors to drive between them. So for the top here, I'm just going to suggest this going back in and the same there. So you see, we've got, we've got these, these lines of crops and we've got this owl flying into it. Now, we, one thing we haven't touched on on the other workshops are flying birds, apart from when we've done them as flat profiles, like planks with a line through the middle. So next year, hopefully, we would do one on things like flying owls, because basically here you've got one of those cylinders. Remember that tin of beans? <laughs> you've got a cylinder with a round front. This is an incredibly simplified owl. And you've got the wings coming up. And like that. And that's and that wing going up like that. I think, yes, William is recording this, so you will be able to look at this in more detail, obviously, later on. And now we'll just reduce the, the mask or the face to a simple sort of Y shape like that with two little eyes, short-eared owl eyes, of course, a yellow with, with uh, black pupils. So we've got, and then you've got some of the tops of the crops, feathery tops barley or wheat or whatever just like the just put a bit of detail here we want to what we want to do here is to show that these the tops of the crops are akin to the to the size of the owl 
I'll put some shading on here. That will give the owl some body. Um, I won't bother putting any details on the top of the wing there. So these feathery tops of the crops will show you that this owl is roughly here. So if the sun was directly above, the shadow of the owl would be down here. And so you'd be able to demonstrate that this owl is about this here. And then looking at the size of the feathery tops here, you would ascertain that means that the owl is about eight foot from you or whatever. But these are things that you can suggest. And they say, I've not, I've not bothered with the sky or, or background there. But that gives you a demonstration of both perspective of things, lines meeting in infinity, supposedly, at the horizon. And the fact you want to try and suggest this owl is coming right out at you. Or whatever. It could be a running hare or a cheetah. So that's one, one way of doing it. Now look at this, um, one of my favourite ones. This is actually from a landscape painting of the Thames near Richmond, I think, by Miles Burkett Foster. But you can see what I've done here is make this Thames into a strong zigzag going into the painting, which this is a very simplified version of the original painting. Of course, it didn't have a red kite in it, <laughs> because by the... 19th century, we'd got rid of virtually all the red kites in Britain, apart from the ones two or three in Wales. So we've got a large zigzag going into the painting here. So once again, I'll divide it roughly into thirds. Well, better move it over. Roughly divided into thirds. So the, the kite, the kite is going to be where this thirds overlap and the, the landscape is going to zigzag for here. So I'm going to do, I'll just roughly suggest a line going to about here, a diagonal coming into the painting there. And then uh, here, the, the Thames goes through a big bend and then comes back again behind another little hill here. So we've got the main thrust of the composition a zigzagging into the picture. And the kite is paralleling. See the way the kite is paralleling the shape of the river. So the kite is going in, the river's going in, and the kite is going across as well. So we've got these elements of the composition before we do anything. And so looking at the, at the sheet again, we'll see that I've just reduced these mainly to hills with trees on and the odd bits of countryside back there. So the, uh, if we, uh, oh yes, there's a, a small, small hill. This won't be exactly like the drawing I sent. But um, as we want some of the we want some of the river showing, we've reduced all of these to simple groups of trees. And the river bank, of course, is not completely straight. But you see, we've already got the main we've already got the main elements of the composition and it's, it's slowly building up. Now as for the kite itself, I'll just have to tip the paper here, no, tip it that way, because we're bringing in another zigzag element, the kite's wings like this, either side of the main body, there's the head, the head's here. Again, you know, um, doesn't have a pointed beak. <laughs> I'm vastly simplifying things here. And the 
the wings. And of course, one of the glorious features of a kite is its wonderful fork tail, although it's more forked when it's closer together. Now that we're going to reduce the ends of the kite's wings just to a few main flight feathers. If you remember when we did the flying eagle, a bit too wide there. When we did the flying eagle, we uh, did that sort of thing. And I'm just making the kite's plumage very simplified. Basically, dark ends to the wings. I say, don't worry about hurrying this if you want to finish it off later. And that's fine. So now we need to do a little bit in the landscape. Now, I think the sky, was there any sky in that? There was sky in it, but I'm going to reduce it simply to just shading like that. And the, the reason, one of the reasons for that, it's fading, it's, you see it's fading, it's fading down because we want the horizon to be light. And then the trees here will be a bit darker than the sky to make them, but we want this passage of light through here. I'll just rub these lines out because they, they're artificial lines. They're just getting in the way. And the, the landscape here is quite, I say that there's a big bend in the river here a couple of trees along there and this of course is a whole different lots of different landscape in here little village and a church and uh, i'm just going to suggest all those sorts of things we'll just do that and make this river bank here a little bit bendy because of course they're not they're very rarely straight down here we want to do a few small trees to suggest the size so that further in the trees bits of woodlands and fields and what have you are getting smaller as they go back into the composition and i'll just put a bit of a woodland there and fences hedges etc but we're leaving the river a white color, a pale color here. So uh, to now we want the for the river to stand out. These trees. I'm just shading them in quickly. Now. Um, Putting them here makes the, the pale kite's head stand out. See, I'm putting very little, very little detail in here. Remember, these are composition studies. These are the things that you do before you do a finished painting, as it were. I just make those a bit stronger. You also want to the kite's tail is a beautiful, when it's fully spread from above, it's the most beautiful orangey, foxy red brown. So you can do the trees dark around its tail and that will help it stand out. As will the pale areas in the, the tips of the wings. Um, just that a little. So there, there we have our second composition study. Just bits and few bits and pieces in there. There's the, the village church and the village, what have you. A few trees. And also if 
to be really clever, you could also put a tiny bird down here. <laughs> That's far too dark, but uh, you could put a tiny bird down there to show that you were you were looking down on the whole scene. Right now, we we'll have to turn this this way up now because we're going to do uh, something similar. But this is a ring oozel, actually a mountain back road. And I took this from a painting. I can't remember who the painting was actually, but you can see we've got this very strong line once again going into the painting. Looks a bit artificial there because I've joined it up there. But you can suggest these things without being uh, without them being as strong as that. So once again, we uh, move that up a little. Divide this into roughly into thirds. So it's, it is very rough. It doesn't. It's only as the whole thing is called the golden section. If you want to look that up, look up the technicalities. That's what it's uh, officially called. Literally, just putting things at one thirds around the around the page. And so, if we where this one overlaps is roughly where the bird will be. And for the moment, I'm just going to do a an oval there. Going in from there, we want this strong zigzag shape. So again, we're going to I'll just draw it very lightly to begin with, about half the way up, and then about a third the way up, and then across, like so. Quite size that. So we've we've got this center of interest here on these zigzag lines. Now at the back, there's a there's a quite a pointed mountain. It's like one we have here in Wales called Connect this in Snowdonia. So that's, but we don't want to make it, nothing is perfectly straight in nature as it were. And behind here, we want some smaller hills that also lead in, that point in. So you want, you want things to be going into the painting and out of the top as it were. And if someone stood on the top there, that must be Tim. He's supposed to be in the shop anyway. So, uh, yeah, so that's the, uh, oh dear. That's the basis. And here we've got, we've got the rocky ledge that the bird's standing on. And that's on a, a slab of rock. That's, this is the side of the rock and you see it's it's roughly parallel in coming down like the the mountain above it and down here there's all sorts of fractures in the rock and what have you but we're going to shade that later we want to shade again the lights coming in this way so everything on this side will be shaded and uh, here I'm just going to do a bit of variation so that you see we've still got that that basic angle going in, but it's not it's not as it's not as basic anymore. It's not as obvious. So down here we want to do some shading to show this is the side uh, as this one now. The side of any mountain it doesn't come down like that it's, it's not like a pyramid remember if it was a pyramid we'd have it like that we want to vary that a little and uh so we've got and of course mountains are not really ever this neat they're much more individual and uh but again we're, we're looking at we're looking at basic lines going across across the whole thing, just finish shading that off. And shading the 
background hills there. And as I say, down here, there's all sorts of fractures in the rock. And a lot of these rocks are sedimentary rocks that have been up tilted in what looks like a global flood by coincidence. And then up thrust that the way these mountains are formed is beyond anything we can comprehend when you look at the, the depth and the thickness of these layers of rock, which cover every continent on earth. And they're all laid by water or by volcanoes. What a coincidence. Anyway, I'm just going to put some a bit more shading in there just to give it a little bit of solidity, but not as strong as the... Oh, sorry. sorry, I just have to readjust. <laughs> Please don't readjust your sets. Well, oh, I've disappeared now. Um, well, there we are. Ah. That's this. Right now, as for the Ringuzel, I'm not going to go into detail now because it's quite a complicated little bird. Big birds, in many ways, are easier to do than little birds. So I shall just make this into a, a singing bird. I say, don't worry. You almost certainly won't be able to keep up, but it has a white breast. And that's all, all I'm going to do with that now. But the here we can get some interesting patterns in the rocks. So this is, these are often sedimentary or metamorphic rocks that have been originally made from sand and mud and gravel and what have you and then turned by immense heat and pressure into the rocks we see today. That's where we get our roof slates from. Some of the best roof slates in the world have come from here, from uh, North Wales, especially Snowdonia. And it's basically compressed mud. Next time you look at a slate on a roof, think, hmm, some compressed mud there, perhaps from Noah's Golden Flood, sorry, Global Flood. Astonishing piece of engineering to turn all those bits and pieces of rock and sand and mud and gravel and clay and turn them into the most amazing and beautiful rocks and so helpful as well for building and all those other things. And that's our amazing loving God who provides so much of this stuff. I'll just increase that shading a little to. Uh, uh, and so there basically is yet another composition. Now you see this is slightly just off center here because that's allowed. <laughs> but the main thing is we've got these lines going into the composition, going across. So it's basically, it's a big cross shape like so. Right, now we've got time for one, one final one, I think. Oh, by the way, I'll just show you, when I was talking about doing compositions, if you did a composition first, you can draw, what I do is draw things out. I can trace them from my sketchbook and draw things out on tracing paper and then move them around the paper. Imagine if this was a full sheet of paper, it would be, uh, and you wanted it, a kingfisher, kingfisher hovering like this, and you could move it around the paper to see where you want to put it in the painting before you before you trace it. So this uh, final composition will be something perhaps a bit more simple like this egret here, egret or heron. And you'll see there's, it's got the, it's the usual one thirds, but we've also got an arc shape. So we're using 
the usual thirds, as it were, but we're also using an arc shape like so, and coming down to the, the third down here and the third down here. This is where we want the main, the main bird, as in the, in the egret here, or heron. I'll do an egret because it's, it's, of course, it's mainly white, and therefore it's nice to get the, the scenery behind it, which shows off the shape. So our egret is, you might recall from some of the other workshops, we're talking about an oval. If we do a rough oval shape here, about so big, See, it's, it's not entirely centered on the, on the thirds, on the golden section. Remember also, you remember that the legs don't come vertically down, the legs come down diagonally, but they, came, they come down to a point below the center of balance. So this is the center of balance. So when they come to the water, there's a zigzag of reflection. They're below the center of balance. And the bottom of the egret is another sort of vague oval, oval shape. Now, the main thing about an egret, of course, is this S shape. So if you practice with your pencil like this, or a heron, practice doing that S shape coming in about here before you commit. And they have got quite long beaks. You see, we've got, we've already got the basic feeling there. So we're going to strengthen the top, make it slightly more angled, like so, and then come down like so. So it's a bit bigger actually than the one on the sheet that we were sent. But now we've got to go up like so, and then something like that. So you just rub that little line out there and then just move it round to draw the beak, just suggest the eye there. So my rubber is obviously not very good. It's, it's, it's amazing for a, for a not very good camera. It sure picks up all the bits and pieces. So make that leg a little bit longer there. So there's our basic bird shape. But you recall from the here, we've got lines becoming thinner as they come towards you. And we've got lines of reeds in the wind. As these reeds are following the shape of the heron, as it were. So if we, again, if we roughly bend the shapes to suggest the wind, to suggest movement. So we've got this arcing shape going across the painting and you can go across that. This is called cross hatching, a very common way to make texture in a drawing or a painting. Just rub the middle of the egret out here. So it's not, uh, now you see immediately the, the, the shapes of the reeds are outlining the heron. So what we want to do is strengthen these. We start from the base and make them stronger and fading out. They get near the top like so. This really throws the basic shape of the egret out, makes it stand out. And then very carefully 
under the chin, coming down the front. Give it a bit more. Not making it a, a perfect arc, of course, that you want to suggest the arc without. Need to strengthen that a bit, it's uh, it really, really throws the egret out. And uh, these these reeds will have fluffy tops, of course. Again, they don't have to be all the same, just vary them a little to give this general shape. But that's, I mentioned in the articles about seeing either the heaving sea or the, the, the lines of waves going through reeds or crops or grasses is a great compliment to put a bird floating over <laughs> where I am here on, in, on Anglesey and in places like East Anglia, you would see something like a hen harrier, a marsh harrier on V wings floating over the reeds into the wind with all that uplift. But we'll keep this keep this as simple as possible here. Um, now, at the bottom, what we want to do is bring these reflections down, fading out as they get towards you. So it's going to, they're going to be like this. The lines get paler and further apart. Of course, this is a this is a calm day. Other days there would be all sorts of waves and wind ruffles. So that's in the actual this one. You'll see I've I've done them more mechanical, but water, apart from being an absolute miracle of creation. Who would imagine that water is made of two gases? <laughs> I've just learned the most amazing thing about creation. If at the quantum level, so-called microscopic level, sub-microscopic level, if you put sound through water, you get light. How amazing. Just think back to Genesis 1. I'm not saying my... My creations are anything like as good as, as God's or human creations are not anything like as good as God's either. But uh, we can at least emulate a little bit and show something of the wonderful creation that's still out there, even though it's fallen. Just imagine what the new heavens and the new earth will be like if we've got uh, such, such miracles already. Now again, this um, if we take this as a source of light coming in this way, and the very light shading on the hair, on the egret down this side, barely noticeable. In fact, little egret's beak is 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 black. So um, I've just put a little shade in there. And then we end up with this white line down the back. And when it's in a painting, of course, it won't be, that line won't actually show up. It will be the dark reeds against the pale heron and the, the shade, the shadow and the shading will reflect those golden brown reeds and the sea, uh, sorry, the, the, the lake 
below. And so you will have, uh, unfortunately, the uh, little egret's feet are yellow <laughs> and they're not shown in this particular painting. But the, um, that's, again, you can, you can do these studies and then you can also put color on them and you can try out different colors. And here's a very handy trick that I've found very useful. If you want to experiment on your drawings, but you're scared of ruining them by putting the wrong colors on them, uh, print your drawings out onto 200 gram paper and experiment coloring them without coloring the actual drawings. You can, you can try out all these, you know, this could have a very blue sky, and this could be all covered in snow. It could be completely white, getting less white as you get down here. So you could have blue and white, and then the uh, the ringoozle. They're only here in the summer, but they have they've got a yellow beak, and that would make that little bird stand out there. And so you'd have it's very useful to have a limited palette when you're painting. Don't use lots of colors at the same time. And you can also go over these with crayon as well as trying out different colors. This would be mainly greens going back into the blue and the greens and blue will beautifully set off the uh, foxy red and dark kite. And the river below could be a very, very pale blue reflecting the, the, the sky above. So that's basically what uh, we're going to do Today, I'll just show you a couple more of the, the ones that uh, you see here that this birch tree is a very common theme of mine. Again, the main part of the birch tree is a th thirds, as are the, the two swans down there. And this was, a, if you want to do long, narrow paintings, I love doing long, narrow paintings from either angle. You can play around with that as well. And that's what these composition studies are for. They're for playing around with things before you do an actual painting or whatever. So I went out to Clamdrin Island and actually drew this scene and then actually painted the whole thing on the spot and maybe could show that in a, a future workshop. And look at this, this is a place called Abathrau here on Anglesey. And again, we've got the zigzag going into the picture and it's pointed up to the gull here and the, the mountains of arrival on the Klim Peninsula. So we've got the same elements here. And this is a different version of the one that we've just done. Look at the shapes going, going the other way. This is the main thrust through the painting. We always want to try and bring people into the painting. Whereas this turn, very roughly, is going across. He's going across the painting. But the idea then is to show a very heavy whirling sea, very heavy sea, that these incredible marvels. You now, some of these terns fly from the Antarctic to the Arctic every year and back. Not all of them fly that far. So you want to show this heavy heaving sea and this tiny miracle of creation floating above all of this, almost angelic-like because of course, if it fell into that sea and got uh, very, very wet, it would be doomed. So you've got this heavy heaving sea behind it and you've got this absolute miracle of creation, which is just floating above it. And possibly that year, one of these turns could have done 170,000 kilometers from the Antarctic to the Arctic and back above these heavy heaving seas. So that's another element of composition, the birds going that way, the sea is, is going the other way, but it's floating above it all. It's another spiritual metaphor. So I shall uh, leave it there. I know that William has got a lot of tasks to do this afternoon. So I'll, uh, I'll stop screen sharing and hand back to William. Apart from the fact you're not sharing screen. Oh, I'm not. Sorry, I'm not. I am now, of course. <laughs> I'll stop. I'll look at the there we are. Right. Anyway. So thank you for listening. I hope you got something out of that. And uh, have any of you managed to do any drawings? 
or if anyone has any questions. Mm -hmm. Have we any drawings to show? <laughs> oh, it's very quiet today. Blows. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Right. Aaron, who's all? Yeah. I sure did our land a kite. Very good. Hers is very best good. Mine. Right. Oh, lovely. You're a bit too close, actually. There we are. There we are. Oh, good. Very nice. It didn't go so well with these. Oops. <laughs> oh, I don't know. That's that's okay. Well, those are. I mean, if yeah. you if you get a a drawing, uh, how to draw and sketchbook, you'll see all sorts of exercises like that. Get them from the library if they'll still let you in the library. <laughs> oh, those are nice. Yes. Like your box, that's an oxo cube and a tin of beans and the pyramid. Very good. <laughs> Lovely. Right. Did you did you learn anything from doing them? Yeah. 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 Good, good. Oh, I like the boards behind. Oh, those are the ones you've done before, haven't they? I recognize that lat wing in the background. I know I don't remember yeah. drawing a horse though. <laughs> no. Very yeah. good. And the stag beetle, have you got stag beetles where you live? Oh, they're gone. Do you have stag uh, yeah. beetles? Yeah. Do you have them in the garden? They have been known to eat cats, you know. Um, yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. right. Yeah, we haven't seen one recently, though. Right. That, that dog of yours is very quiet. <laughs> Is it a dog or is it a um can't work out what it is actually? No, what is this? Yes. <laughs> oh, it's a frog, I see. Oh, sorry. Right. Hi, frog. <laughs> <laughs> ah, sorry I called you a dog. I'm sorry. I do apologize. <laughs> and um Georgia would like to show theirs. <clears throat> Right. Oh, just a bit too close. That. Let's see. Right. Oh, nice. Yeah. 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 Right. Ah. Yeah. Uh, we also have. Oh, oh, I think we have a battle there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very nice. Yes. Yeah. 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 Stop you it. Why are you better than paper? <laughs> yeah. It's too bangle. far. <laughs> Very nice, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, no weapons now. <laughs> Very good. Did you enjoy doing those? Yeah, yeah. Good, 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 good. Now, are you, are you going I to also do did a self-portrait. A self-portrait? Who of? Me. me. <laughs> oh, that's a very good drawing. It looks just like you. <laughs> oh, was that the real one? That's a drawing. Right. Ah, right. Ah, I saw that actually. <laughs> right. well, if nobody else has any questions mm -hmm. or um, 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 pictures to show, mm -hmm. then um, we shall say goodbye for today and hopefully see you in the new year. Yeah. And we hope to be God able bless to bless everybody. Somewhere. Goodbye. All the best for you know what. <laughs> Although, of course, he was born in the autumn. But there we are. <laughs>